Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Talent Gap Fireside Chat, where we talk about causes of and solutions to the talent gap. I'm your host, Pete Strauss, and joining me today is Frank Seepman. He's the SVP of CISO Services at Solvitur Systems. Welcome, Frank. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks for being here, Frank. Uh, can you give our audience a little background on yourself and your career thus far? Well, I have been working in uh, cybersecurity or information security, what it was called when I started 27 years ago. Um, I started out with um, a b- a big four consulting companies. I worked a total of um, seven years for big four okay. consulting companies, Accenture, Deloitte, and Touche. Uh, and then for smaller companies and mid-sized consulting companies where help shaping their consulting offerings, before I got into uh, the operational side where I was um, working as CISO or Director of Information Security for approximately eight years of my career. Very cool. So I'd imagine that uh, over the years you've you know, you've held a lot of different titles. You've probably been somewhat involved in um, the the hiring process for, you know, various people in security. And you've seen a lot of different things in your many decades. So um, how have you generally found the relationship between uh, in your previous positions between the the hiring team, your team, uh, HR, recruiting, things like that. Do you feel that it was always uh, a good relationship or were there some challenges along the way? Uh, over the years, I've worked with uh, many different uh, people to just address uh, the needs that I had uh, to bring talent on board and, uh, and address uh, some of the gaps that I had in the team. And um, I had positive and negative experiences. Um, most of the time, everyone was trying to do the best job, but uh, particularly in the early years, it was difficult to define uh, what exactly a cybersecurity or an information security professional is. Um, I had a very hard time, for example, um, uh, filling uh, the role of a security architect and um, HR uh, always came back with someone that was more like a system administrator. So to explain the difference between an architect and a system administrator is a little bit like uh, you have an architect that builds your house that has knowledge in many different areas and knows how things come together. And then you have someone that is a plumber and he has all the details about plumbing. You need both people, but I was looking for the architect. Yeah, and it's interesting. I think uh, security is still kind of a nascent industry, really. So you're talking about the early days. I, I feel like we're still kind of in the early days, and and there's a, a lack of um, definitions of specific jobs and responsibilities and and things like that. And you know, one's one company's security architect could be another company's security engineer, and there's really no standardization across the board, from what I've seen. Um, that's why I'm a, a big believer in uh, being explicit about the both the hard and the soft skills that you really need somebody to have on your job description and not being too needy and keeping it to the things that they absolutely must have on day one uh, to be able to start contributing and where there are any gaps, you know, filling the, those in over time. Because at the end of the day, nobody's going to be intimately familiar with your environment specifically uh there's always some intangibles even if they know every single item on the tech stack um you know they're they're not going to understand how everything works together uh what the different responsibilities of each of the team members is and and how those are are differentiated um when you were having uh, i guess challenges in in filling that role was it mostly an issue where you had generalist recruiters and they didn't really understand security or, um, you know, uh, would you say that was the case? Uh, First of all, yes, you're right. Uh, The uh, uh, organization uh, plays a big role in what the hiring needs are. They're they're organizations, they're very technical. uh, They're not very formal uh, from a maturity standpoint, process maturity standpoint. their hiring needs are, uh, uh, are different. 
uh, meaning uh, if you don't, don't have process defined, you probably need someone that is a little more well-rounded than actually um, an organization that is uh, very mature, like a Fortune 100 company. And yes, uh, it was um, the lack of understanding um, the information security space at the time, uh, what exactly was needed. So it was more generalist uh, than, than actually uh, someone that was specialized in cybersecurity. Gotcha. Yeah. And, and I, I find that issue quite often. Uh, our clients will often come to us when uh, their internal recruiting, recru recruiting teams have had difficulty filling a security role. Reason being is, you know, they're filling everything from uh, an accountant to uh, marketing admin to, uh, you know, sales. It's tough to develop a specialty when, you know, you're working on so many different things all the time. Uh, and what people don't realize is how long it, it truly takes to train a recruiter in security. There's just so many intangibles to know. Uh, it moves so fast, the technology itself, understanding how everything interacts. Um, I think there's sort of a drive in the external recruiting space right now to just throw junior recruiters at the problem because there's so much money to be made. Um, but what ends up happening is uh, they don't produce results because they just they haven't been in the industry long enough to understand all these things. And, uh, and then hiring managers get burnt out. And then, you know, us seasoned recruiters have some difficulty overcoming objections with potential clients uh, because they've just, they've had such terrible experiences with recruiters. So um, I'm a big advocate for understanding, hiring managers understanding that your recruiter, if they're not a security specialist, it's going to take a long time to get them up to speed. Uh, the best thing you can do though, uh, is just stay very close to the recruiting process. You know, keep an eye on those job descriptions. Um, make sure they truly understand on a deeper level what they're out there looking for beyond just a couple of keywords. Um, have you encountered, I guess, any specific strategies over the years to to really educate those recruiters that you're working with to make sure that they're, you know, presenting you the right people? You're actually bringing up uh, an interesting point that not only applies uh, to recruiters, but also to hiring managers that don't have a security background. Uh, so uh, what I see a lot is that uh, from bottom up, they hire people uh, instead of from top down, uh, not understanding the true need uh, of the individuals that they uh, need to come on board with the right skill set. Um, so the, there is some hiring and then eventually the hire maybe a CISO or a manager that is heading up the team, uh, but it's misaligned to what uh, the manager or the CISO would assess. So as strategy, um, as already uh, uh, laid out, um, you probably want to bring in someone that uh, takes a look at the environment, understands the business, understands the technology that is supporting the business and then um, defines a need of uh, what actually needs to be done. Not everything means that you bring it in-house. So, uh, a typical example would be uh, a SOC. Uh, a SOC uh, means you have to really hire uh, many people. You have a 24 by 7 operation. Uh, you might want to evaluate if a third party is probably a better choice uh, than, than actually hiring all these people which puts a big dent in your uh, budget. Yeah, I've seen a lot of companies going to the, the MSSPs for um, those sorts of things. And uh, I believe that since often that SOC function is outsourced to these MSSPs, uh, the onus is, is on the MSSPs to train the entry-level folks, since it's tough to, to justify training an entry-level person uh, for your security team if you have limited budget, limited resources, limited time. Um, you know, you, you have a problem that you need to solve. And, you know, sometimes at the entry level, those people simply do not have the deep expertise that you need to solve that problem. Um, and oftentimes that's where you see the, you know, the BCSO services coming in. Um, so I guess speaking of MSSPs, have you gone through the, the process of evaluating one and, and what do you look for if you have? Uh, yes. So I, I had um, a couple of positions where I had to actually do an evaluation. 
and um, it's becoming a, 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 a crowded space. Uh, mm -hmm. There are many MSSPs now, and everyone claims they're doing the best job. Um, my uh, my recommendation, or, or from my experiences, uh, go with someone that uh, is a little bit uh, bigger, but not too big. Uh, I say that because if you're um, in a uh, David Goliath uh, uh, situation where you have an MSSP that is much bigger than your organization, don't expect them to accommodate any specific needs that you have. Um, find someone that is um, similar size or maybe a little bit smaller. Uh, what you get out of it is um, multiple clients. They see way more than your internal SOC. So if another um, client of the, uh, of the MSSP has a security problem, they see maybe uh, something being exploited um, where it's not well known that there is actually an exploit out there, they uh, can take uh, measures to protect the other clients that they have. Um, so it's it, I see that as an advantage. Uh, I also want to understand um, from a staffing perspective, um, you know, can you uh, accommodate that someone goes on vacation, is someone getting sick, and um, are you certainly running just with one person trying to handle 20 clients at the same time? Uh, so there, there, I can keep going there probably for the next 20 minutes, uh, what I'm looking for. That's a great place to start for sure. Um, yeah, the, the staffing perspective I think is super important. Uh, some MSSPs do run very lean. And if you can figure out a way to, uh, you know, ask some deep dive questions when you're evaluating them about their staffing levels and, and comfort and uh, how many clients each analyst handles and stuff like that, that can be very illuminating. Because, uh, yeah, I think the, the more burnt out or the more clients that somebody's managing, the more likely they are to, to miss something for sure. And then, you know, too, you could ask about uh, seniority level on the team. Um, you know, is it a bunch of tier ones or do you actually have some more senior people at, at the helm? Uh, and to kind of add on to that too, I think another good thing to ask about would be industry specialization. Like you mentioned, kind of getting some uh, crowdsourced threat intelligence. Uh, if that MSSP focuses specifically on your industry, they're going to be seeing a lot of uh, the more common attacks in that specific industry. I'm thinking of uh, one client of mine in particular, they're, they're based out of Nashville. They work with a lot of healthcare companies. And so uh, when they bring on a new healthcare client, they're very, very well versed in that particular industry vertical. So, you know, and they have that small dedicated team and they're able to devote more time than, you know, maybe some of the larger guys that, that overload their, their analysts. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's a great uh, little tangent we went on there for, uh, for MSSPs. Um, uh, going back, I guess, to the talent gap in, in the title of this show, uh, do, you do you view the cybersecurity talent gap as a real thing? And, and if so, what does it look like? If not, uh, why do you think that? It, I believe that the numbers that are out there uh, are uh, way too high. Do we have a talent gap? Yes. But in specific areas uh, where we have that talent gap, I don't think we have a talent gap in the entry level positions. Um, and uh, looking at some of the LinkedIn uh, job postings, seeing that 200 people are applying for a job, um, tells me either uh, people are very uh, confident <laughs> that they can do the job and don't have the experience and apply anyways, or we really have a lot of people that are qualified for that specific job and are applying. So uh, this, uh, the numbers, nobody uh, was ever able to explain to me how they arrived at these, I think I, at one point of time, I saw millions uh, of, of security um, uh, professionals are needed. Um, so I'm not a believer that across the board, we have uh, such a big need. Do we have a need in specific areas? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm of the same opinion there. It's not evenly distributed by any means. And I think the, the numbers are overblown. I think it, it, I could be wrong on this, but I believe how the number was arrived at is they just look at open job postings. But you know, if you, if you consider that 
many different uh, postings for uh, different locations that inflates it, old jobs that are no longer active that somebody just never took down. That happens all the time as a recruiter, I can tell you. That's very common. Uh, or multiple staffing agencies all posting the same job for the same company. So those are, I mean, I, I would say we're orders of magnitude off of the, the real number of a shortage of talent, I think. Uh, and it's certainly not at the entry level. I saw recently on LinkedIn, um, you mentioned a couple hundred applicants. Uh, it's a, a entry level remote job. I believe it was ThreadX they had posted recently. They got 5,200 applicants for a single Holy job. Holy smokes. <laughs> yeah. And, and even if you, I've also heard that, you know, LinkedIn, they kind of inflate those numbers. So when it says applications, that's just somebody that clicked on the button to go to the outside uh, application site or whatever it may be if it's not a one click apply. So that's not necessarily representative of the number of people that actually went through the whole process to apply. But even if you discount, you know, say take half out of there, that's still 2,500 people applying for one job. So if you, if you kind of extrapolate from that number, you know, we have at least tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people trying to break into the industry. Uh, and there's just not enough places for them to land. Uh, do you view security as an entry level field? It sounds like maybe you got your start in, in IT. Um, so is it possible to create truly entry level jobs or is that kind of a fool's errand? I believe there, there uh, are entry level jobs um, and it might be also because um, I, I grew up in Germany and Germany uh, has a slightly different approach uh, for, um, let's say, engineers that come right out of college. Um, the, the companies need to train them for uh, a couple of years before they become fully functional and uh, valuable engineers. So uh, I think we also need to uh, probably adapt to something where we say, okay, someone has a college degree or has several certifications, but is lacking the experience. Let's bring them in and uh, train them on what, what security actually means uh, in, in a real life uh, environment. Uh, it's, it's different than the classroom and it's certainly different than passing just a certification and not having their uh, experience that goes along with it. So what would you attribute the difference there then between, uh, attribute it to the difference between the U.S. and Germany? Is it just a, a cultural thing where in the U.S. we're just less likely to want to mentor and do apprenticeships and things like that versus Germany? Or is it the way that the, you know, the companies are working here in the US that we're too focused on, you know, quarterly profits or something and not looking at the long term, what would you say is the big difference there? I think the difference is that uh, German company uh, companies, when they hire you uh, as an engineer right out of college, um, they want to put an investment in, in into that individual. And um, I'm not sure if every company here in the U.S. Uh, sees it that way, that they need to put an investment uh, in, in, in an applicant. Um, I've seen now organizations where uh, the training, the continuous education is actually not sponsored by the company. When you hire a security professional, uh, there is additional cost when it comes to maintaining their certification, uh, maintaining their knowledge. They need to go for training uh, in a perfect world every year. And uh, some companies, they hire professionals, and um, then uh, they are not uh, really willing to put that in. So I put it in the same category as like uh, we bring someone on board, we have a need, but um, our investment is basically the salary, and um, we're not willing to do anything more, which is very short-lived because uh, that security professional will either move on or not be very useful anymore in, in five, six years uh, when, when their knowledge is not current anymore. Yeah, and, and I think uh, I've just kind of noticed, it seems, culturally in the U.S., uh, and it's, it's getting worse where the employment relationship is becoming more transactional now than it used to be. You know, my dad worked for the same company for 30, 40 years. That just doesn't exist anymore. He had a pension. That doesn't exist anymore. Uh, you know, today people are moving on after six, 12 months just for more money. So 
you know, uh, and, and when you see all these layoffs, it's like, well, you know, do you really uh, give a bunch of loyalty to a company that's just going to cut you the, the second things get tough? Mm, that's that's tough to justify, I think, is somebody on the, the employee side. So there's I think there's a lack of investment and loyalty in both directions, companies and, and employees. Uh, that's why I think, you know, my favorite clients are the ones that that actually invest in people and they have the lowest turnover. And, you know, while they, they may, um, they may make less money on each engagement, especially if it's a consulting firm, the fact that they're not paying to hire a new person every six or 12 months, they're actually coming out ahead in the long run. I would guess I'd love to see, you know, the, the numbers crunched on that. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, the retention piece in security? Uh, do you see that as, as an issue? Uh, are we, more transactional than we used to be as an industry? I would agree with that assessment. Um, and you mentioned more money. I think uh, that is just one reason why people move on. Um, there, there is a lot more. It's like the burnout. Uh, security can be very stressful. Uh, I remember I had one uh, situation where uh, a, a VP told his um, whole group of people, don't go for lunch with Frank because uh, you might spill something that he uses against us. I was like, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it, this, this understanding of uh, uh, the development team, uh, marketing, everyone, that's the hand that feeds the organization. Nobody has any interest to to. Uh, take that away. It's important. Without that, you don't need security. So my job is also depending on it. Uh, but it, it was something that um, even after 15 years, it's still sticking with me. <laughs> so um, burnout uh, is, is is another thing. Toxic environment, as I just described. I mean, this is just not um, really um, something where people want to stick around and uh, Another thing is uh, if you can't make any progress with security, you know uh, that the company is accepting risks that are way too high. And just looking at uh, reports, statistics, uh, um, you know uh, there's a high chance that something happens. Um, and as a CISO, you're likely to be the first one that actually um, is, is held accountable for how did that happen? It's like, this is your responsibility. So if, um, you might have tried for months to, to actually make that change, explain to the organization that this needs to be addressed, but it's not being addressed. And if things pile up, uh, you see the CISO move on, and it's not unusual that CISOs leave after one or two years, maybe three years. This is very common, uh, at least what I see with my uh, peers uh, in, uh, in my network on LinkedIn. Yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine the, the stress level of, of being a CISO and in, in day-to-day everything is on fire and uh, you know the, the ceiling is falling. And um, I, I think that probably extends all the way down through all those levels of the organization too. You know, if there's an incident, everybody is is stressed from the analyst up to the, the CISO. Uh, you, you bring up a good point about um, folks not feeling like, you know, security is a priority or uh, a lot of folks I've talked to for, for some reason, it seems to be a lot of people that are in SOC analyst positions. Um, they'll tell me they're not satisfied because they have some really good ideas about how to improve things, whether it be tooling or process or uh, whatever, you know, and it doesn't always cost money to implement some of these ideas. Uh, but they they basically feel that they're just kind of hitting a brick wall. They're basically told, you know, uh, stay in your lane, stay in your place. You're just an analyst. You know, we're we're not going to listen to you. This is the way we do things. Uh, and and those folks are super ripe for the picking for for recruiters. You know, um, so I can't stress enough how important it is as as a hiring manager, as a CISO, to uh, listen to your team, whether it's you know. Uh, weekly uh, stand-ups or, you know, quarterly check-ins. Um, as an HR person, I ran an HR department for a consulting firm a while back. Uh, I would do quarterly check-ins with an, uh, employees. Um, and I think having a third party to be able to do that is actually a really good thing, too, because they can uh, parse feedback from employees, um, basically 
filter the feedback, uh, maybe make it sound a little bit better, and then pass that on to the hiring managers. Or, you know, some hiring managers just have such a good relationship with their team that, that they're able to, to encounter any problems firsthand too, which is, is also a good thing. Um, so you, you mentioned kind of a few reasons why uh, people might leave. What about uh, a few reasons people might stay? Uh, staying, uh, I think uh, having a functional team that works together, um, they don't need to be necessarily always aligned, but they need to respect each other. Um, knowing that the manager uh, actually cares about the people uh, that they have on the team, uh, I, I think is very critical. And um, also seeing progression, um, not only with salary, but also uh, potential with, with responsibility and title, um, which uh, touches also on what you said, if they have an idea, Let's take a closer look at it and see if that is really something um, we want to do or not. I, I'm a big believer in um, teams are more successful than, than actually individual. I don't like um, this, this setup where you have, uh, a, let's say, a manager and uh, the manager is, is basically sucking the air out of a room um, and that's the only opinion that uh, that counts and uh, the direction that needs to be um, set. Uh, it should be something where you uh, uh, hear from your team. Um, I always say I like to lean on my subject matter experts. Uh, just know enough about certain areas in security that I can call BS. So if someone is trying to yeah, be the expert but doesn't really have the background, um, I can figure that one out. But other than that, I, I want the experts to tell me, you know, what is uh, uh, their opinion. And then based on that, form a direction, a strategy, or sometimes just a tactical approach to solving a problem. And you, you bring up a good point about respect, uh, mutual respect in all directions on a team is, is so important, especially for folks that feel like they're underlings and, uh, y- you know, um, they they feel like they don't get much respect from the top, but at least their their uh, immediate manager should you know foster a, a sense of camaraderie and mutual respect and and things like that. Uh, and and I should clarify, I, I'm not saying for hiring managers to implement every idea that your team has. Uh, I just think it's important to listen, consider, you know, uh, at least give a, a fair ear, a fair shot to ideas, even if you don't implement them, and you know, uh, have the emotional intelligence to say. You know, look, this, I really appreciate the idea. I understand what you're going for. Um, that's not something we can do right now, and here's why. And give people reasons why, because uh, that's super crucial. Um, yeah, I think I'm thinking of the, the best manager I ever had. It's when I first started in recruiting. I had one really, really good manager and then one really, really bad manager back to back. The good manager, everybody was rowing in the same direction. Everybody wanted to slay dragons for this guy. Uh, you know, he... If, if he had some bad news, he would sit us all down and say, look, this, is, this came down from corporate. This is what we got to do. I know it's not ideal. I was a recruiter not too long ago, but here's what we got to do. And uh, we would make jokes. And the, the, you know, the whole team was just very cohesive. We had a great time. And you know, we, we didn't have very many good jobs to work on, but we made the best of it. Uh, and then I transferred to another team. Uh, and uh, that manager was very authoritative. Uh, and and authoritarian you know uh well he he basically came up in the military and that's probably part part of the reason why coupled with his personality um but it was very much um i don't care if you have an idea i'm gonna publicly shame you if you know if you do something wrong even though you didn't know you were doing something wrong uh and it it just created a lot of toxicity and everybody was uh, very eager to get out of there and at one point uh it's like the floodgates opened one person left and another person left then three more people left and then before long that whole team was gone um so uh, super important as as a manager to to know if there's toxicity brewing in your team uh keep on top of that try and listen to people i know not everybody is necessarily built that way especially if your uh your personality is very heavily leaning towards disagreeability um <laughs> it can be tough sometimes to to feel like people might know something that you don't um 
but yeah, uh, I guess that that's a good way to kind of wrap that up in a bow. Um, what what's your uh, position, Frank, on the uh, certs versus experience versus uh, formal education debate? I see it on you know LinkedIn quite a bit. People debating that whether you know certs have a bunch of value and and that matters the most, or you know whether it's it's somebody's experience that matters. What's your take? So my my take on this is that experience is for me the most important thing. Um, yes, uh, there there might be entry level p- uh, positions where I'm like, okay, we will teach that individual, and um, they need to have a solid foundation. Um, education uh, versus uh, certification. What I uh, like about certification is uh, people talk a common language. A CSSP talking to another CSSP, they use the same vocabulary. They they understand each other. I, I've noticed over the years that um, uh, people that don't have the certification, they use terminology differently. Uh, sometimes the, the colleges seem to be using uh, different approaches of what they teach. So there's a certain personal flavor. Uh, In the end, um, college education uh, versus uh, certification, I wouldn't make uh, uh, any big distinctions between the two. Uh, If there are two candidates where it's like, okay, he has a master's in um, information security or cyber security versus uh, we have someone here that has uh, five years of uh, experience in a CISSP. Um, it, it really depends on what they have done. Um, as a student, you can uh, work on the side. Um, but when I was a college student, uh, I had a choice. I, I could go back to a job where, where I had a certification and I could earn um, a normal salary during the time off from, from college, or I could work in a computer center of the university for significantly uh, less money, but get the experience that I wanted. And um, I chose to go w- with the second and, and work in a computer center just because I wanted the experience. Uh, sometimes people, they have the expectation is like, okay, I come out of college, uh, during college, I didn't really get any additional experience I have now their certification and everyone needs to hire me. Um, that's simply not the case. Yeah. I think, um, the, the culture around work and degrees in the U S has changed a lot in the last say 30 years. Um, you know, when my dad went to school, basically the idea is you, you get your bachelor's degree, you'll get job offers coming out of school. That's just how it worked. Um, you know, I, I went to college back in, you know, graduated in late 08 for my bachelor's and then got my MBA. Um, but even back then, you pretty much had to have experience. There was just, um, there, were, there were no jobs available for people with no experience. And I think it's gotten even worse, especially with uh, how degrees have been, become so ubiquitous. Everybody's getting degrees these days. So uh, it's not the differentiator that it once was, uh, especially when you consider in, in the tech field, how things move so quickly. You know, you might be taught about a certain theory or a certain technology five years ago, and, and all of a sudden that is no longer relevant today. Uh, so it really is all about experience. And I always tell people that are trying to break into the industry, if you get the shot to get any experience whatsoever, take it. It, it might be a terrible job. It might pay poorly. You might have a terrible boss. It doesn't matter. Just take it. Get Take your shot because <laughs> not everybody gets that shot. And there's there's a lot of folks looking to break in. So uh, have you ever been speaking of kind of entry level hiring? Have you ever been in a situation where your team hired an entry level person? Uh, and if so, you know, how have you done it? And if not, could you think of could you make the case for hiring somebody entry level when you have limited resources and, and budget? Actually, I had a couple of situations where um, individuals were pushed on the team <laughs> so yeah uh, less a choice but um making the best out of it um sometimes uh or i remember one individual very talented was picking up stuff very quickly 
So I think that was actually a good hire, even there was no background with security, but um, understanding the the concepts uh, and 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 yeah. So you don't want a security expert running around and it's like, don't worry about um, this won't happen. Um, that's not really our job. Our job is to really evaluate uh, the risk and then uh, do the right thing. And not everyone um, has that right attitude. Um, I, I've met security uh, professionals and they didn't make it very far. They, they actually switched career uh, because they didn't have the right attitude. I, I know it sounds a little bit like, hey, uh, you guys think you're so special. Um, I mean, it, it, it's just an observation that I made over the 27 years in the field. So you mentioned the right attitude in, in the DFIR world. What I hear is investigative mindset is, is super important when you're doing forensic analysis. Um, it sounds kind of similar to, to what you're saying there. What in your mind, can you define what the right attitude looks like uh, for, call it a, a real, you know, long-term security professional who's not going to, you know, uh, leave the industry in a couple of years? What do you, what do you think is that magic combination of, of uh, I guess, traits? So I have uh, met people that were paranoid. Um, I'm not talking about being paranoid. I'm talking about being uh, realistic when you take a look at it, putting it into perspective uh, with, okay, we, we, we have some studies that show this is actually something that is exploited very often. So what can we do about it? Um, be open-minded. Uh, security, I think, uh, is stuck at the moment on technology will fix it, AI being the latest and greatest, in reality, in majority of the security incidents, we have a human factor that played a role where a human being simply made a mistake, uh, not even malicious, but made a mistake, and that resulted then in a breach or a lot of money that company had to invest to, to fix it. So um, being open-minded to new approaches, I, I think at the current point of time, would be something I would be looking for people um, to do in, in cybersecurity. And maybe not just stopping at being open to new ideas, but, but actively pursuing those new ideas, being curious, I think is a big one. Uh, wanting to know the potential ramifications of X, Y, and Z, or uh, you know, continuous learning and, and passion are things that I hear quite often as uh, you know, hallmarks of the, the ideal uh, security professional. Um, Obviously, though, there's a lot of people out there that are that are burnt out and, uh, you know, maybe they do have sort of a, a toxic team or, you know, maybe their their manager isn't great. Um, what would be your advice to, to somebody who's burning out right now? Um, what can they do to, you know, kind of stay in the industry, continue solving these problems, improving security for companies, uh, but not sacrificing their, uh, you know, their personal life as well? Um. It's difficult. Uh, I can probably talk about my personal situation uh, a little bit because um, after so many years, I got to the point where it was um, quite stressful, um, the jobs that I had. Um, and uh, there were personal matters, a divorce, um, parents, one of the parents dying. So uh, what I did was actually I, I went part time. Um, I was able to do that um, because financially um, I'm I'm okay. I'm not saying I'm 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 wealthy, but I'm I'm doing okay, and that helped me to realign a little bit my life. Um, I, I'm raising a daughter, a teenage daughter, and um, you get a different perspective uh, when you get out of the super stressful. Hey, technically I'm 24 hours, seven days. Um, I need to be available because. I mean, we all know incidents, breaches. It's not like uh, they happen between 9 and 5 p.m. Uh, they can happen on the weekends. So over the years, I spent a lot of time um, working weekends, evenings, long hours, coming in early. Uh, so that is, uh, I mean, my personal approach. Is it a silver bullet? I don't know if it works for everyone, but for me, uh, it helped me. 
and I'm just getting back in in the game to go back full time after I had some uh, time to recharge over the last two years. Yeah, I think a lot of very driven, very intelligent people they they have the tendency to continue working until it's too much. Um, yeah, sometimes I have that tendency, and I, I have to tell myself, "Look, man, you just got to take a break." Go, you know, take for, you know, take a walk outside, spend some time in nature. For me, that's what helps get away from the keyboard, uh, clear your mind, uh, you know, and on a longer term scale, I, one thing I think a lot of Americans do pretty poorly is live below their means. So if you live below your means and you're able to bank some money, you're, you have much more freedom to take a step back or take some time off or, you know, go part time or maybe take a job that's more interesting, less stressful for less money. Uh, I think the golden handcuffs in security are very real. Uh, I've worked with and for consulting firms that that's how they held on to people is just keep throwing money at them. Uh, and I, I think a lot of people, that's the shiny new object and they tend to go in that direction. But uh, the research actually supports the fact that that won't ultimately make you more happy uh, or happier. Um, there's actually kind of a plateau that happens. More money does make you happier up until I think about a hundred thousand a year, and then it just levels off, or, yeah. or it diminishing returns past that, you know, hundred thousand a year mark. So, uh, you know, it certainly encouraged folks to think about what's most important in your life, your family, and and things like that. Take a step back, and you know, if if you need to, maybe search for for something else out there. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity even now when the market slowed down quite a bit. Uh, in security hiring, I've, I've certainly noticed, uh, I think, some some looming economic issues are causing a lot of companies to, to slow down a little bit. Um, what are your thoughts on uh, sort of hiring in a down market? Do you, yeah, I don't know if you've been in this situation, um, but have you seen uh, differences in like the, the number of candidates available or uh, if the types of candidates that you've seen have, have changed at all so in downturns uh what, what i'm noticing is um there's a lot of talent out there just because someone uh was let go doesn't mean they are uh not valuable and and and, and should be hired again uh unfortunately uh what what the industry particular it uh industry has adopted is um everyone that is older than 35 um, is probably a candidate that needs to go because they are not uh, keeping up with the pace that we have in the organization. Um, I always counter by saying, uh, you know, there's a lot of expertise that you have uh, with these um, uh, older employees that you are letting go. And uh, don't be surprised that your team is making a mistake that uh, uh, was done already 15 years ago. Uh, so I'm a believer in uh, mixed teams. They uh, should be diverse, um, not only from, from a cultural perspective, also age, gender. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, probably a perfect team when you have this diversity at uh, uh, multiple levels. Uh, and um, as I said, uh, in, in, in a uh, down market, lots of talent, Unfortunately, uh, usually your budget also uh, gets cut or you're standing still. Um, there's no increase that you can maybe uh, justify another higher. Um, yeah. But... Uh, sorry, I was just going to say we're, we're definitely seeing that where, uh, you know, clients that were hiring, they just ceased hiring now and, and maybe they did layoffs, maybe they didn't, but they're basically trying to do more with less. And so what ends up happening is they just, uh, instead of hiring somebody else because they don't want to, you know, have that additional cost, they just put more responsibilities on the plates of the people that are already there, even if there is an increase in the amount of work to be done. And then people burn out, then they leave, and then they end up, you know, paying more to to backfill that person when they, they could have saved a little bit of money, maybe by hiring somebody kind of junior, offloading some of those responsibilities of the senior people to that junior person. Uh, and, and keeping their, their team, you know, bright eyed and, and bushy tailed. So, um, yeah, that's, it's an interesting time that we're living through once again, for sure. Um, well, I think we're coming up on time here, Frank. So, uh, just one last question here for you that we ask everybody, 
Uh, what are people not talking about, but that we should be as an industry, especially as it relates to hiring? Oh, interesting question. Um, I think the, uh, one of the biggest problems, and I, I see a lot of uh, female cybersecurity experts that are still saying, hey, this is a, a male dominated uh, uh, discipline. Um, um, we, we, we're still discriminated. We earn less. Um, at, at the same time, uh, ageism. Um, I, I don't think that is uh, discussed enough. Uh, to to uh, really uh, get to a point where we uh, come to a common understanding, this is um, how we want to tackle it. We're living in a world, uh, or at least here in the U.S. and many of the developed countries, where um, uh, the, we we have more, or we're getting more and more older people and less and less younger people. Um, the expectation is to uh, have their retirement age pushed out and at the same time we, we're, we're technology heavy where we have the situation that older employees women uh, are discriminated against um, I'm not pointing the finger at anyone or so I'm just going with uh, what I see uh, on LinkedIn what I hear from individuals I, I think that needs to be discussed um, as like what are we going to do about it Yep, I absolutely agree. And it's actually a podcast I recorded yesterday in another episode. We, we had talked about ageism a little bit. Uh, and I, I certainly agree that it's, it's a real problem in the industry, more, I would say, than any other type of discrimination that I've seen. Uh, there's a often I'll hear things kind of like under somebody's breath or, you know, something where it's not explicitly saying, don't go find an old person, but it's like, you know, we need somebody that can work at a fast pace. Pace is off, often brought up as the, as if to say that older folks can't handle fast paces. It's like, well, no, they've been in the trenches for years and years. They've probably seen more fast paced incidents than anybody else has. Uh, and maybe that's an interesting challenge for them. Uh, so not judging a book by its cover, I think, is, is super important when hiring. And uh, a lot of companies, I think, are, are less aware of their biases than perhaps they should be. So um, that's a great point. Yeah. It, 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 what comes to mind is don't work harder, work smarter. And exactly the people with the experience are the ones that can tell you this is how we can uh, be smart about a particular work. Uh, I Absolutely. Know. Yep. Yep. And I always quote the Pareto principle, 80% uh, of your results will come from 20% of your effort. So focusing yep. on that that effort that produces the most results is, is the most efficient way to go about things. Uh, well, yeah, that's a, a great place to end. Uh, Frank, I appreciate you being on. It's been a great conversation. And uh, to our guests, thank you for, for uh, or, or, I'm sorry, our audience. <laughs> thank you for listening. And uh, Frank, if, if people want to reach out to you or, or keep up with uh, what you're doing these days, what's the best way to do that? Well, they can reach out to uh, me by email, frankpuritseepman at gmail.com or uh, simply on LinkedIn. Um, you can find me there. Awesome. Yep. LinkedIn is, is the place to be for sure. Well, thanks for your time, Frank. Thanks, everybody.